I'm back in Utah at the Mudbots facility and I'm really excited to show you the first batch plant mixer that we featured on this channel. Mudbots has been developing technology to stop using continuous flow mixers and begin a much more advanced technology that will automate more of the process and allow the machine to create custom batches depending on the humidity, sunlight, and other parameters of your print day, which we all know at this point are changing on an hour by hour basis. Mixer pump systems that weren't specifically built for concrete are one of the biggest pain points on a 3D printed construction site. That's why it's so important to develop solutions that can be automated at scale. The mixer pump system is a very manual process right now. A system like this, in the beginning, will be run manually, but once they collect enough regional data, everything can be automated with sensors, and it won't require anybody at the mixer pump system at all. This is gonna be an immense step in bringing cost effectiveness towards reality at scale. What everybody wants to see. A batch plant that makes all these printers work. You know, anybody can distribute mud and put it where you want to, X, Y, Z. 3D printing's been out for a couple decades now, so. Unfortunately, a printer doesn't work without uh, the batch plant. I, it can, we have software that tells customers the ingredients and how they need to change per batch, small batches. You can't mix up a yard of material because the stuff above, as it comes down into the pump and pumps through, is gonna get harder and harder and harder every single minute. To hand batch, our software will tell whoever the mix master is what the ingredients need to be for every single batch. It's uh, laborsome and any mistake made will result in very inconsistent prints. And so the batch plan is the key to small batches that are adjusting based on temperature and humidity. Batch plan is key. 100% key to consistency, being able to print without stopping. So when you're looking at this, we've got uh, obviously sand, cement, and lime, three main ingredients in a mortar mix. Then we have our smaller hoppers. Uh, if you start going down that rabbit hole, you're gonna see there's hundreds and hundreds of different formulas. You got graphene, you got fly ash, plasticizers, polymers, uh, synthetic fibers, and on and on and on. So the batch plant is able to do uh, seven different dry ingredients and then our water dosing does uh, three different uh, liquid ingredients and it, it's essential so uh, the batch plants automatically metering every single every one of these has a metered valve okay uh, they're motor driven I don't know if you can see this right here quick disconnects on every one of these whether it's a tri clamp or our larger ones for getting in and clearing out material. One of the challenges is getting material to flow and the higher the humidity uh, of your material or moisture level of your ingredients, it just likes to brick. And so we've had to put oscillators in all of these. Uh, and then we, you know, as with any batching, you gotta try and run with the driest materials possible. The, the more humidity or uh, liquid you have in your mixes, the more problematic it becomes. And it, it has to be consistent. It has to be consistent and has to be able to adjust real time. Push a button. The challenge with concrete printing is it's boring. Uh, the first five, six, seven passes are interesting. And then after that, uh, it's snooze time. So you gotta be able to go from halfway asleep to being able to adapt to anything that happens. And what we've seen with hand batching is you keep doing this same repetitive movement you get a text from your girlfriend, you look at it and you're like, oh shoot, did I put the lime in this time? Kyle's a manager for the company, software engineer. He runs all of our production engineers. All right, what's going on here, Kyle? Uh, this is our uh, first batch plant, first production batch plant. Uh, we, got, we got seven hoppers, uh, a sand hopper, uh, two bulk material hoppers. Uh, so we got a cement hopper and a lime hopper, 99% of the time that's what you're gonna be using them for. And then you can put powdered or granulated additives in uh, these four hoppers back here. Um, so if you want to put plasticizer, uh, fly ash, uh, retardant, accelerant, uh, anything else you need to uh, make your material printable for the conditions that you're expecting when you're printing. What was one of the big challenges you had to overcome to get this machine working? Oh man, wet sand does not like to go through a hopper. Not at all. Um, so we kind of came up with a couple solutions to that. We've got an agitator in there, we've got a nice wide opening at the bottom, and we went with an auger valve instead of a rotary butterfly valve. Um, 
and then we also dry out our sand. Uh, we've got a. Do we have one back there? We no. Have, no. They bought it. Uh, we've got a. We've got a large ribbon. drum. That uh, ribbon mixer. Yeah, ribbon mixer, and we uh, hook a heater up to it, and we ba it's basically like a drying uh, a drying machine for your sand. So, what's your experience operating this system versus uh, like a dual mix? What do you mean, like a dual? Oh, like a compared to a continuous flow mixer. Well, it, this doesn't. This isn't a mixer. This is just a batcher. So, you, uh, with a dual mix, you've got to have. I mean, in theory, you could hook this up to a dual mix. You still need a mixer pump. This is just supplying the material. This in is the right quantities. This is uh, uh, giving you the ability to say, "Oh well, uh, our temperature has gone up by five degrees. We need to bring down the accelerant, or we need to start adding a retardant so that we can keep our print perfectly consistent all the way up to the top." Instead of measuring in shovels with an intern. Yes, exactly. Instead of measuring in shovels and instead of the guesswork. This also lets you go back and see, uh, you're going to have a, a hard time when your uh, intern with a shovel uh, says, yeah, I think it was like, I don't know, somewhere between 11 and 3 that I started adding two shovels instead of one. Uh, and then that two shovels, that's not a very precise measurement. This lets you go back and see exactly what happened and when. Uh, that. Is we anticipate that that's going to be useful because if you are changing your mix, it, it can change the strength of the wall or the characteristics of the wall while you're printing. I expect that at some point, um, some regulatory agency may want to be able to see, well, uh, what, what, what is the strength of the mix at this layer versus at this layer versus down here? Uh, what are the water, uh, the vapor barrier, uh, how, how strong is the vapor barrier up here or, or down here? Or if it's below grade, Right? You're probably going to want to print with a different mix below grade than you are above grade. This lets you pull out a complete report that says exactly what the characteristics of the mix were at each level. Um, I think going back to that is uh, single mix, proprietary mix, just doesn't work. If you don't have a mix that's changing based on temperature, uh, you're going to have to stop. You can't keep adding water. As <laughs> A lot of people have seen you keep adding water to mixes, you add volume, and when that shrinks back out, you get cracking everywhere. I think a lot of other companies we're seeing are, are being challenged with cracking everywhere. And when you have a proprietary mix where you can't change the ingredient, the last thing you want to do is keep adding water as it gets warmer throughout the day. So the mix we're printing with in the morning is cold. We need accelerant in the afternoon when it starts to get warm. We need retardant. And all those baby steps along the way, that mix is changing. So proprietary mixes don't work, and that's what's precluding people from printing to eight feet in one print pass because they are limited by this mix where you just add water. It's not like pancake batter. One of the problems with a proprietary mix, uh, you, that, whatever company's producing that mix, they're gonna have a lot of logistical challenges. They may only have three or four plants across the whole country, uh, and getting that material to where it's needed uh, is gonna be expensive and you know, frankly, it's going to add a lot to the cost. Uh, this allows you to source local ingredients. I mean, you can get, uh, this will run any kind of type 1, type 2, type 4 cement. Uh, you can run a uh, lime that you can source that locally. And then your sand, uh, that's, that might get you a little bit trickier because you got to have a specific, uh, a specific, what's the word I'm looking for? Granularity? Yeah, yeah. The, uh, the fines, the, the report where they, uh, sifted screening the screening report yeah uh, you may have to you may have to look around a little harder for that but it's going to be way cheaper if you can find it 30 40 50 miles from where you're printing versus having to get it trucked in from 300 miles away whole thing's pretty quiet you can um, turn it on from your phone yep the software that runs this guy runs on a runs on a computer it can run on your print computer it can run on a, just any computer you got lying around the software that runs this guy um, I wrote it uh, we, we just got another software developer which I'm really excited for because uh, I wear a lot of hats around here so the software runs on a, on a computer and then you can access it with uh, a phone another computer a tablet any any device you got nearby you can access the software uh, and control the batch plant um, so part of that comes down to uh, you need to make a decision, you got something wrong with your mix, somebody needs to go in and update it. What's the easiest way to do that? Well, the pilot, who's supposed to have clean hands, he's not supposed to be touching the materials, he can go in say, oh yeah, well, it's got a little warmer, uh, let's, let's go down one on the accelerant. Or, uh, you know, for some reason our mix is, looks, looks real dry, um, we need to figure out why that's happening, but for now, let's just go up a little bit on the water. That's um, in uh, hand, or manual mode. Yeah, well, 
automatic yes. yeah, yeah. it does it by itself. But you can still, you can always make those adjustments. Yeah, and then we, we allow you to create a temperature coefficient. You can measure the temperature and relative humidity. Any other variables you want to measure, we think the most important are temperature and humidity, but any other variables you want to measure, uh, you can, you can uh, bring those into our software and our software will track uh, you can apply a coefficient to each ingredient. So I uh, say as the temperature goes up, um, if it goes up five degrees, we want to add you know so much more cement and we want to uh, add a little bit more water too. Um, anything like that. So yeah, and then you can run it in manual mode. So when you're get, getting this calibrated in, if you start with a new material, you're going to need to calibrate to see uh, are the rotary valves still giving you what you expect. They'll, they'll be close. But to get them spot on, you got to calibrate it when you run a, a new material through it. Uh, so manual mode, I can, I can sit out here, I can go ahead and turn the conveyor on, and then I can, uh, let's say I want to dispense a half a liter of cement. So there, there goes my cement. And of course you'd have some guy with a bucket here, uh, or you would take the conveyor belt out and set a bucket under there, and that's how you get your uh, bash plant dialed in. Did you flash the app to the screen? The Not yet. Okay. Um, then we'll do the uh, the line, and now we can check. I've turned the lime down. Uh, lime likes to absorb moisture from the air, and unfortunately, the guys that were using this last uh, did not. They left the lime in there a little bit, so it's a little crusty. Um, so I had to turn it down nice and slow to make sure we get consistent flow. Um, and then, yeah, and then sand. Now, I don't want to dispense that much sand. I'll turn it down. And there's about a liter of sand. When you configure your mixes in the system, uh, you can input as much information as you want. The cost per liter, uh, how heavy it is, and uh, a volumetric coefficient. So, for instance, if you add 10 liters of sand, 10 liters of cement, 10 liters of lime, you're not going to end up with 10 liters of mud. And, and from the customer's perspective, how do they figure out what materials to get where? Yeah, that's something we didn't anticipate in the beginning. We developed over the period of several years different mixes with different characteristics not anticipating that when they go home they might not be able to get a sand with the exact same screen uh, characteristics so it's been it's been a challenge uh, an example would be if I buy type S mortar mix from Home Depot and then try and buy the same thing from Lowe's completely different uh, water absorption the amount of fines all of these things come into play uh, if they can't go home and get the same plasticizer or polymer, these chemicals behave differently with each other. And so what we've had to do now is as soon as a customer buys, we send them these, the, here's a screen report on the sand, see what you can get locally. Here's the plasticizer we're using. Here are the different uh, 10 ingredients that we most commonly use. And then they start sourcing those immediately because it gets expensive. If you can't get your sand, you've got to import it in. You might, I mean, same problem with the proprietary mix from halfway across the country. The chemistry has been the challenge, it really has. Uh, originally, we started off with a type S type uh, base and then started adding our ingredients to that. Our cost ended up being about a half a cent a cubic inch for printable material uh, or about $11 a running foot walls up uh, so for an 8 foot wall 12 inches about $11 a running foot the batch plants allowing people to use bulk ingredients and has cut that number in half so I think if you saw the mini home we did uh, we were about $800 of material to print that home we printed it in one day and we had about $750 $800 in labor for a three man print crew people uh, they're amazed when they see, wait a minute, I'm printing an entire house and that's the mixer? Absolutely. Small batches. You gotta have small batches. That drops, by pulling this, it drops directly down into our pump, which we have designed. Uh, our pumps are about seven to $10,000.
uh, and we want to have dual redundancy in everything. If anything goes wrong, you got to be able to fix it. So we'll recommend that you have two pumps, which would suck if my pump was $37,000. We recommend you have two mixers, two pumps, extra hoses, everything on the job site so that if something goes wrong, you got five minutes to remedy it, five minutes period. So uh, that's what the training is so intensive about. A week of printing every single day here to get that team uh, developed like a NASCAR team. This here, everyone that comes, they have to print a house or something large scale, 400 square feet generally. Uh, so the team that just left last week, uh, this is a private uh, steam room. Uh, they'll be printing a ton of these. They do a lot of work for developers, uh, resort developers. And so they'll be printing these private steam rooms. If you walk around here and look at this, you can see just how beautiful it is. And then if we come inside, you'll see the consistency of They're already trying to make use of this a little bit, but uh, each one of these are tapered. Okay, they have a taper to them. They're gonna increase that taper. Uh, they're gonna put fiber optic lights in the top of it. Uh, but when you look at our, just the consistency of the wall, it's because of all the things we're talking about right now. So they're gonna, they're gonna make a lot of money just doing something as simple as these uh, for large resorts. With the new batch plant mixer? Hmm? Was this with the new batch plant? Or this was hand batched. Uh, the team that bought this, the printer for this. You start them off with the basics. Yeah, well, Everybody they have to learn. they have to learn how to hand batch in case anything goes wrong. And if you don't know how to hand batch and learn the chemistry and what you're trying to accomplish, if anything goes wrong with the batch plant, you won't know what to do. Can you say anything about the interior structure? Uh, it's a hollow wall, three and a half inch uh, infill. And uh, they finished the outside. They just, this outside, they did not, this is just scraped, uh, sponge troweled and finished while we were printing. Very smooth. So it's, uh, yeah, it turned out gorgeous. And we're glad they couldn't put it on a U-Haul and take it home, so. <laughs> this was done there week four of training. Um, and I mean, this is what you get. These are perfectly consistent. I mean, th these guys, uh, we were hands off at this point. Our last week of training, we don't, we don't intervene. We gotta, we gotta wait until they blow up the whole machine before we'll step in and, uh, and uh, help them out. As I said before, the, it, you change an ingredient, even cement, okay? One company versus another. The chemistry is different. And so, uh, these are Gaylord bags. It makes it, if you have a lifting device, uh, you have to be able to feel your hoppers. So they lift those in the air, you pull the string, all the material drops down into it. If they don't have that, then you use auger elevators so that I can fill material here and it's going up an auger elevator and dropping into the top of hopper. Uh, we spend quite a bit of time with that, different equipment that's available, clear to even rebar threaders. Our customers are able to get those because we have to tie our rebar clear into the footing. It's threaded. So we sell a rebar threader. We have crushers that will crush any waste material uh, and break it back up into three quarter inch uh, size gravel. And it's used as road base, uh, under sidewalks, walkways, stuff like that. We don't want any waste whatsoever in what we're doing. So there's a lot of auxiliary equipment that's available depending on who they are, what they have available, and what their needs are. Everybody else is trying to do a proprietary mix with a specific supplier here, there, whatever else. We learned, you know, four years ago, it just doesn't work. Proprietary mixes don't work. They, they're never gonna work. I don't care if Sacrete gets involved or Rapid Set or a proprietary mix is never ever gonna work because if you don't have an, a, a material that changes based on temperature and other factors, I mean, even mud temperature in the wall, we have sensors in our walls. We have a sensor at the nozzle. We're looking at the heat and temperature of the mud coming out of the nozzle, which is not, what's in the mixer. It's a big people, when they send samples in to labs to have their materials tested, they just mix some material up. The stuff you mixed up in a wheelbarrow is not what's coming out of that nozzle. The longer the hose is, the more pressure it takes to push the material through that hose, and you're in, in effect squeezing all of the water and air out of that mix. 
So now you have to figure out ways to put air and water into your mix so that you have the proper hydration. We make all of our own parts here so that we have inventory on hand. Uh, when we're prototyping and trying to figure out how to make something work, uh, everything that's good on paper the first time, you start building it and you recognize the challenges uh, and improvements that need to be made. So we do that tirelessly until we get to where everything's working the way we want it to and then we import as much as possible. So right here you have, you see a whole bunch of hoppers. Uh, one of the downsides of all the printers we've sold so far is that as we, now that we have the batch plant, we got orders like crazy. Not only current orders, but all of our people from the past want the batch plant now. So that's our bottleneck in producing as quickly as everybody wants us to. Uh, a good point to make is that uh, customers are wondering, when should I buy, when should I buy? Can, I'm gonna wait until this is done, or that is done, or this is done. We don't ding uh, our existing customers. They got in there in the beginning, they helped with R&D, they proved things out real time out in the field. Uh, so we feel loyal to them. Uh, when we come out with an advancement, you see our prices will go up uh, as we add more and more to our printers. But our existing customers, they only pay half the price of anything as new developments are made. So they really appreciate that. They don't pay any markup at all on replacement parts or anything that they need. They pay our cost. In fact, most cases we just give them the link and have that part drop ship directly to the customer so there's no delays whatsoever. Now if uh, a customer does want a larger batch plant and it's not a problem for them, if they're gonna be on a development for uh, months and months, we make them any size that people want. So obviously the larger the hoppers, uh, the less time you have to spend filling them. Uh, Every one of these hoppers will have a DVR camera on it so that the pilot standing at the control station, he's able to see all of his hopper levels, stay on top of that. There are six cameras always on the print from different angles. Uh, we do that for training purposes. We do that for uh, quality control purposes. Uh, so he's got, six, he's got a lot of cameras to be paying attention to. Uh, the position of the pilot is most important. Everybody's developing and advancing. Uh, Mudbots is throwing out a challenge. We'll compete with anyone in the world. Print in your own backyard. Of course, Jared has to be there. But uh, everything's on a trailer. Goes from a trailer, setup, print. The walls on the inside, whether you frame them, stucco them, fur them out, the walls have to be done on the inside. Uh, you get done, take the thing, put it back on the trailer. Clock starts when you start unloading. Clock ends when the last thing's on the wall. The walls have to be smooth wall on the inside and they have to be stuccoed or finished product on the outside. So if I wanted to make it unfair, I'd say we have to do basements and multi-story, but Jarrett says no. So uh, anyway, that's the challenge, uh, $100,000. Uh, anybody that seriously wants to take us up on it, we will write up exactly what it has to be so it's fair for anybody. But walls have to be done, inside and outside, part of the deal. I love the idea of this challenge. If somebody's willing to step up to the plate and compete against another 3D printed construction company in the name of technology, then let's try to find some sponsors for this. Maybe do a prize like $100,000. Maybe we can get Home Depot, Lowe's, someone behind it. If you're interested, reach out to me. We'll coordinate it with Mudbots and whoever else wants to compete. I think this could be an awesome thing to really demonstrate the comparative capabilities of each company. Our very first printer was built of steel. It was heavy. It was uh, very hard to move, very hard to assemble. Worried about safety, things moving around in the wind when you're trying to put a machine together. Uh, so for us, uh, stage trussing was the logical direction to go. Large structures, very strong, wind passes through it. You look at all the cranes in America, they haven't changed in a hundred years. I mean, four bolts, four pins, and the wind passes through, because the last thing you want with these larger structures is something that's gonna be blowing around and uh, ruining your print. So everything will transfer down to your nozzle. Uh, we went with trussing. Um, 
everybody understands it. It's lightweight. You can pick up a 20 foot piece with one hand. Uh, our printers don't have any lifting devices uh, needed. We don't need forklifts, cranes, or anything like that to lift them. Uh, another reason we wanted to go with a lightweight product. So, the, a lot of people, how long does it take to print or whatever else? They actually need to back up one step. The costs begin when the truck shows up on the job and you start unloading and trying to assemble your printer. So we want a printer that assembles in three to five hours depending on the size and uh, we don't require any additional lifting devices. We have a remote controlled elevator on every leg, lifts it up, you put a leg on, lifts it up again, you put another section in. And then trusting gives us the ability to set up on uneven lots because most lots are. If I got a walk-in basement, uh, I got this side of my printer's up here, this side of my printer's down here. Uh, trusting makes that very, very easy. So that's, that's you know, it's hard to patent a, a printer, a 3D printer. They've been out for a couple decades. Uh, but that gives us the ability to patent how we design our printer, our hose management system, uh, our lifting, all of those kind of things come into play. The time it takes to print starts when the truck shows up on the job, you got to assemble, you have to print, you have to put it back on the truck, or move it. I mean, we're the only ones that have wheels on our printers for a large printer of 50 by 50. You were here about a month ago. Uh, everything's changed. Uh, right now we're doing uh, three to four printers a month. Uh, when you were here last, there was a big 5070. Uh, this one's a 5070. Over here we've got three more under construction and we're training every single month with two, three print teams coming in. They'll spend an entire month with this training and printing on their printer. There are a lot more employees here than there were last time. Did you hire? Or? We are always hiring. Hiring's a challenge. We, you know, the, we are trying to find uh, a much larger building, 50, 60,000 square feet. If we had time, we would. I've got seven months till the lease is up, but uh, we're just growing like crazy. So yeah. It's like a construction company never builds their own headquarters. They just work from the, the mobile offices yeah. and build. Brother. Well, the challenge is forecasting out a year, two year. Everybody wants to do a three year lease, and we can't do a lease with anyone unless they will agree to give us more footage when we need it. Otherwise, we're gonna get screwed again. 90%, 95%, they don't even know what concrete printing is yet. People are just starting to come awake. Uh, I had no idea how quickly the industry would start to catch on to this. The fever pitch of people wanting to utilize it, they see the advantages, governments, universities, uh, developers, it is going crazy. So, uh, and less than 5% of the world have even heard the word concrete printing. So, uh, Jared's in a great, position of going around and showing everybody uh, the technology and advancing it couldn't be credited for creating this awareness that is really helping humanity and helping people to solve problems that until now there hasn't really been a solution for. Well thanks I just try to bring my camera cool places.